Teaching, proximity, distance, and language. This video is my third in a mini-series that's about exploring the deeper latencies of teaching and the pedagogical situation more generally. In this video, I'd like to explore the dynamics of proximity and distance as they occur in the craft of teaching, and then explore how employing poetic language can enhance them. But as usual, before beginning, I'd like to acknowledge right up front that all of this is based upon my own personal experience in the classroom, which consists of 25 years of teaching psychology and philosophy full-time at the undergraduate and graduate levels. Therefore, my insights may or may not apply well to teaching at the elementary school or high school levels or in domains substantially removed from those of psychology and philosophy. Anyhow, through my years of experience, I've discovered that teaching requires striking a balance along several dimensions simultaneously. For instance, in my last video, I talked about balancing the dynamics of structure and continuity against those of spontaneity and discontinuity in the pedagogical situation. However, as I said earlier, in this video, I'd like to explore the balance between psychological proximity and distance. By the term proximity, I'm referring to how we teachers are able to cultivate a sense of closeness with our students so that our students can experience us as familiar and approachable. It seems to me that this dynamic is important. That's because when we teachers come off as too remote, too distant, and or aloof, it tends to diminish the distinctly human element in the pedagogical situation. At that point, we risk having our teaching turn into another sequence of obligatory, routinized chores, not a source of real joy and vitality in our students' lives. So, I find that it's important for teachers to take pains to approach and make contact with our students' worlds, to speak to their experience in a way that they can readily access and absorb. However, I find that this is another fairly common failing among teachers, at least at the university level. It seems a little ridiculous when you think about it, but I've found that it's surprisingly easy for teachers to forget what it's like to be hearing about some topic for the very first time, rather than from the perspective of having been involved with it continuously for a quarter of a century or more. In other words, it's easy for us teachers to rest a little too easily in our sense of superiority and to neglect the task of putting ourselves in our students' shoes, which is what allows us to make contact with their world in the first place. But while it's important for us to make contact with our students' world, it's equally important for us to offer our students what lies beyond their world, not only in terms of the details of the concrete content we're conveying, but also in terms of our way of being. This is part of what I mean when I speak of distance. Part of the art of teaching has to do with balancing our familiarity to our students with our strangeness, with our otherworldliness, and by how we've been altered and transfigured by the river of years that separates us from them. But, in much the same way that it's possible to err on the side of too much distance, it's also possible to err on the side of too much proximity. This is, on the whole, probably a less common error, but it sometimes happens, especially among teachers who are younger, and who consequently already invite a greater sense of proximity due to their age. The way it usually works out is that younger teachers easily gain proximity but struggle with distance, whereas older teachers easily gain distance but struggle with proximity. But the point here is that relying too much on one pole or the other tends to compromise the potential of the pedagogical situation. That's because, in my view, that potential arises mostly out of balancing our proximity to our students with our distance from them. Great teaching requires both, at least in my view. To be a great teacher is, among other things, to be both close by and far away at the same time. This balance, of course, plays out in our interpersonal presence as well as in how we present the concrete particulars we're conveying to our students. However, at this point, I'd like to focus specifically on pedagogical language. Of course, in this area, one important aspect of the balance between proximity and distance 
has to do with the overall level of linguistic sophistication and intellectual subtlety of our presentation. Here I feel that it's once again important to speak in a way that's accessible to our students, but also in a way that draws them beyond their already existing level of ability. So, in terms of overall linguistic sophistication, I find it's best to aim a little higher than our students' average level of comfort, but not so high as to leave them feeling hopelessly lost. However, it seems to me that the more important challenge has to do not so much with linguistic sophistication, but with the dimension of poetic evocation. That's because our task as teachers is not merely to inform our students <clears throat> or even to make them more articulate or cognitively agile, but to draw them toward the deeper reaches of life altogether. In other words, the art of teaching is not merely about conveying knowledge, but about inviting our students to move toward wisdom. And here is where I feel it's important to infuse our factual presentations of things with a distinctly poetic sensibility, so that our students can not only comprehend what we're saying, but feel it as an aesthetic event, as an invitation to join with the poetic unfolding of all things. Basically, I feel that our work as teachers is to meld concrete factuality with the secret language of life itself, with the hidden music that sounds and whispers in the wild wind, in the skies, and sometimes in our classrooms. Well, okay, that may sound a little unconventional, but here again, I feel that there lies a kind of balance, to balance the language of mundaneity and predictability with the language of the extraordinary, full of all of the force and fury of life itself. A couple of weeks ago, in my video entitled Teaching, Continuity and Discontinuity, I examined the place of humor in pedagogical discourse, especially with respect to how it can precipitate moments of discontinuity in students' habits and expectations. But I find that we teachers can achieve a similar kind of discontinuity through the strategic use of poetic language. In the case of both humor and poetic language, the point is to deviate from students' expectations, from the tried and predictable, especially in a way that arrests students' attention and begins to move them toward the deeper possibilities inherent in the pedagogical situation. However, I find that all of this requires a much deeper level of commitment to the craft of teaching than is typical, at least in university classrooms. The reason is that to poeticize academic material, to make it really breathe and pulsate, requires that we teachers open ourselves to the underlying aesthetic power that resides in what we're teaching. And it requires that we allow that kind of extraordinary potency to pass through us, more or less unencumbered by the trappings of our egoistic investments, and to permeate our students' experience, all the way from their intellects, through their hearts and bodies, all the way to the nether reaches of their souls. This requires that we allow ourselves to become not merely purveyors of knowledge, but its poets and oracles. As aficionados of discourse analysis like to say, we need to embrace the distinctly performative dimension of language, that is, we need to learn to speak not merely to inform, but to evoke an experience, and ultimately to change our students at the level of their perception, and even at the level of their existence itself. And here again lies another fairly common source of failure for a lot of teachers at the university level. It's because we don't usually take the time and energy to lay claim to the true poetic potency of our knowledge. In some cases, this is probably because we feel like we're too busy to undertake such a daunting and difficult task. However, probably more commonly, it's because we're simply not very aware of that underlying potency in the first place. In my video entitled Teaching, Reasons, and Passions, I argued that we teachers fail largely because we don't really know why we're teaching, at least not in any deep or convincing way. That is, we often don't really know why what we're teaching is worth learning in the first place. And our inability to recognize the poetic and aesthetic element of our knowledge would seem to be another piece in this puzzle. We struggle with teaching out of our passion, partly because we haven't yet discovered our poetic souls within teaching's craft. 
And so our offerings to our students often seem drained of the kind of rhapsodic, poetic resonance that would speak to our students' hearts as well as their intellects. However, in much the same way that balancing proximity and distance demands that teachers offer a double presence to our students, one marked by being both close and far away, so too does balancing prose and poetry in our lessons demand that we use language in a double way. Of course, at one level, our language as teachers needs to conform to the predictable dictates and conventions that govern everyday speech. Without this, our students won't feel enough familiarity to travel along with us. At another level, however, our language needs to be poetically evocative. Without this, our teaching risks descending into monotony. The trick, I find, is to use language that speaks in ordinary ways, but that also simultaneously initiates a metamorphosis in our students' perceptual fields. But to learn to use language in this double way is a subtle and demanding art, one that requires a deep commitment from teachers, as well as an acute sensitivity to the innate potency of words and phrases. Perhaps at this point, some may object that this is all well and good for the social sciences and the humanities, which would seem to lend themselves much more readily to poetic expansiveness than the natural and mathematical sciences would. And perhaps this is true to an extent. However, it seems to me that the natural and mathematical sciences also embody an underlying aesthetic and a kind of poetry. As I learned during my own youthful fascination with mathematics, sequences of equations can easily embody a compelling elegance and a type of musicality. But, as I suggested in my video on teachings, reasons, and passions, it's just that we're not usually in the habit of allowing ourselves to feel it, or to teach from the nexus of the sensibility it engenders. But, maybe it's time to start. Just a thought. Well, okay. At this point, I'd like to end by summarizing the principal ideas in my last three videos about teaching, mostly so that you can understand the overall vision of pedagogy I'm presenting in them. My first video focused on the question of teachers' underlying reasons for teaching. In that video, I exhorted us not to accept simplistic or default reasons for teaching, but to quest after the most compelling and potent reasons possible those that naturally allow us to feel a genuine and abiding passion for the craft, as well as for the opportunity to contribute to our students' lives in the deepest ways possible. After that, my second video focused on the dynamics of continuity and discontinuity as they occur in the pedagogical situation. In that video, I described humor as a way of disrupting the regularity of our students' expectations as a way of fostering surprise, and ultimately as a way of calling our students more deeply into life itself. Finally, in the video you're now watching, I'm describing poetic language in much the same way, as a way of precipitating moments of discontinuity in our students' experience, as well as a possible point of entry into the more powerful latencies of teaching's craft, and most especially as a way of striking a crucial balance between proximity and distance in our relationships with our students. Well, okay, I have more to say about all this, but it'll have to wait for a later video, because this one's getting kind of long. So thanks once again for watching and listening, and for simply being alive in this universe as you are. Take care. Mm -hmm.